This is the Mooks and the Gripes podcast. Hello, everybody. My name is Trevor. For example, Paul. Paul, how are you doing this morning? Ooh, I'm doing good. Uh, kind of a little bit of a slow start, I would say, this morning, but hopefully we'll get going and, you know... Usually once I start talking to you, the juices start flowing and I'm ready to go. Yeah, one of these times that might not happen. Uh, certainly <laughs> I'm worried about that with me and that'll yeah. like, hopefully be okay. <laughs> we'll trust our listeners to just be kind and not tell us, you know, yeah. because we're half asleep. No, no, no. I, I'm feeling pretty good. I have my son. I had to get up at 630. I had to take him to the school. He's got a cross country meet this morning. So... I've been up longer than I usually am on these mornings. Oh, there you go. That could be detrimental, actually. I'm wondering <laughs> if how much of this is just if I'm in a dream state. Things hey. things flow better than they do if I'm not. <laughs> Given some of the conversations we're going to have today, that actually might work yeah. out nicely. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we, we should uh, definitely be looking for any, any way to get into that dream state. <laughs> yeah, listeners, we are on episode 35. As we have said in the past... Whenever we have an episode that ends in a five, we're going to step back and do a an author focus. It doesn't mean that it's an author that we, you know, have scholarly, deep, deep knowledge on. It's just an author that we want to discuss in a little more depth and to give some time to. And today's author is Cesar Ira. Now, I thought that I had read everything in English by Cesar Ira. Turns out there's an art book on contemporary art that he was pub- that he published with a different publisher. I never knew about it. I got called out for that on Twitter. I am sorry. <laughs> but I have read everything that New Directions has published by him that has come out in English. And I think that that's most of uh, what we have in English, if not 99% <laughs> of what wow. we have in English. And I'm not really inclined to go read his on contemporary art book um, because I've heard that it's you know, not not particularly where it's at. And that's not why I love Ira. But we'll get into right. why I love Ira later. Yeah. I guess that before we get too much further into Ira, we have a few matters of business. First, I do want to thank new Patreon supporter, Michael Keto. Michael is an excellent uh, friend. He, he roams around uh, on Instagram and on Twitter and on TikTok, which is where I see him mo- most often as Knowledge Lost, talking about the books that he's reading. And uh, thanks so much for the support, Michael. I, I yeah. am excited by that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And yeah, he's a, he's a great source of knowledge and good book ideas too. So it's fun mm-hmm. to have him on board. Yes, absolutely. And I just do want to remind listeners that you can subscribe to the newsletter at Substack. It's, you know, it's MOOCs, M-O-O-K-S-E, and and Substack, <laughs> I'll put the link to it in the in the description of the podcast. So you can just you know if you're on your phone, you can click on that, and it should help you subscribe. It's free, but it's where we put together our show notes, where we put together our show plans, where we talk about giveaways and other things like that. Um, again, all for free. Uh, but that's where a lot of the information about the show resides nowadays. And I've been pretty happy with it. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of cool because if you're on there, you can actually just reply to the email that comes to you with the newsletter and it'll come to us. Um, And I think that's kind of nice for things like giveaways where, for example, we are this morning giving away a copy of Haldor Laxness's Salka Valka, translated by Philip Rufton and recently published by Archipelago Books. Have you been pretty proud of me, by the way, Paul? I've been pronouncing Archipelago correctly for some you know, time, I, I think. I have been. I've, I've absolutely noticed. I think it's, yeah. <laughs> nice job. Thank you. Thank you. It's It's been a work in progress. Um, you had to battle years of schooling to, yeah, to overcome it. Uh, that's what I blame it on, is years of schooling. <laughs> it probably is just that I never paid attention or something. <laughs> I have to step back from that too. <laughs> well, I think every reader can commiserate with that where there's a, a word that you've read for years and years and in your head, you pronounce it whatever way. And then you hear it pronounced and you're like, wait, that is not what I thought it was. Uh-huh. So yeah, I get <laughs> yes. it. Yes. Yes. And, but it's been, uh, so we have the, the Salka Valka giveaway and in the newsletter, for example, we've had some people who just Click reply to the newsletter, and I get their entry that way. That's really and cool. so I, I, I enjoy that. Why don't we go ahead 
and give away that copy of Salkavalka right here at the start, Paul. Are you okay with that? Absolutely. I'm excited. All right. All right, Paul. I've done the drawing. Will you do the honors of announcing who has won this copy of Salka Volka? Happy to do it. Looks like the winner is Morgan Claire Wensley. Congratulations. Congratulations, Morgan. I'll be in touch because I've got your email address that you used to enter the contest, and I will get your address, and I will ship this out with maybe a little goodies on the side. I, you know, we'll see about that, of course. Yeah. <laughs> oh, congratulations, Morgan. That, that book sounds like so much fun. I know we've mentioned it in several episodes in a row, but I'm looking forward to reading that one soon. It yeah. sounds like a real treat. Here we are giving away something that we've not read yet, but <laughs> we have faith. I, I have no doubts that it's, uh, you know, we're doing the right thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. Paul, I think that you yourself have a, maybe a, a giveaway announcement you'd like to make now. I'll, I'll let you I go do. forward. Yeah, since we're giving things away, we might as well keep it going. So I'm very excited to announce that we're going to have the chance to give away another book today. And it's a book that just came out. It's called The Remembered Part. And it's by Rodrigo Frizan. It's the third part of this trilogy known as the Remembered Trilogy that came out from Open Letter Books. And um, I don't know, Trevor, have you read these yet? I, I read the first one when it came out, and it is absolutely delightful. It is odd and fun, and, and it encapsulates a lot of the things, maybe a little bit of Ira, I would say, but also to mm -hmm. some of those other authors that we enjoy. And so, yeah, this is the third book in the trilogy. And so we're happy to give away a copy and send it out to anyone, either domestic or internationally. And the only thing we would ask that you do to enter is just basically all you really need to do is just tell us that you're interested. But I would love to hear your experience with Frizan. If you've read the first one, if you've read the first two, if you haven't read any of them and you're just looking forward to jumping in. So just give us, you know, if you want to give us a few details about that side of things. But more than anything, you just need to reply and say you're interested in joining. And then in our next mm -hmm. episode, we will announce the winner, just like we did today with Salka Volka. Again, this is the third book in a trilogy. So... We understand that there may be some of you who haven't had any experience with Frisson yet or with the invented part or the dreamed part. We'd recommend you do so. I have I have read the invented part and loved it as well. I have not mm -hmm. read the dreamed part because part of me at the time when it came out, I knew that there was going to be the remembered part yeah. by that time. And I thought, I'm just going to do it all at once. So, That's exactly what I decided too. <laughs> and for anybody who, whether you've um, read them or not, or you have any knowledge, I would also recommend um, Chad Post, who is kind of in mm -hmm. charge of the letter. He has a really delightful podcast known as the Two Month Review, where they will do series of book, a uh, series of podcasts where they dive into a book. And they did one for this, the first book in this trilogy. Yeah, the invented it's a few part. years ago, the invented part. It was a couple of years ago, but I would encourage anybody who's interested to go back and listen to those because they're really fun. And even if you've not read the book, you know, there's some spoilers. But in a book like this, I don't know that that really matters. I know I listened to that and it kind of inspired me to go ahead and read it. So if that's of interest, I just thought I'd throw that in there, too. But mm -hmm. yeah, I'd encourage everybody to, to jump in, whether you've read the other ones or not. And you can build your collection backwards if you need to start with number three and then yeah. <laughs> go back and buy the other two or whatever you need to do. But yeah. Yeah, so here's just a really quick thing to, to entice some people to enter who might otherwise be like, well, I don't know anything about this. Uh, the protagonist narrator of the invented part and the dreamed part returns to find an answer to the question, how does a writer remember? In particular, how does he, a writer who no longer writes but can't stop reading and rereading himself, remember? So, you know, just a little bit of a... Of a, of a thing going on there it's these are these are funny at the same time being very insightful about these kinds of questions at least i think so based on the first one <laughs> yeah exactly no Man, i think here we are bet. giving away another book we haven't read <laughs> we need to start having readers do the work for us on these we'll give you a copy of this book then come back tell us tell us what you think and and you know, <laughs> exactly. Either that or change our strategy because both of the books that we're giving away are giant books that have come out within the last couple of months. So yeah. if we're going to hold ourselves to the standard of reading everything that we give away, we're either going to have to delay our giveaways or start reading these tomes as soon as they come through uh, our door. There's no sense in doing that. We'll, no, we'll just keep not. doing it this way. <laughs> All right. Well, Paul, let's jump in and let me ask you, what have you been reading? 
Yeah, so I've been taking full advantage of Women in Translation Month, as a lot of our listeners probably know. August is Women in Translation Month, and so there's hashtags and all kinds of other fun things flying around Twitter and social media that are, you know, helping people kind of just chat about different books by most often it's, you know, books written by women, but I know sometimes, a few times there's been some where maybe it was written by a man, but translated by a woman. But the general idea is just women working in translation. And so, yeah, I've read several just wonderful books so far this year. Uh, the first one that I read was Trieste by Dasa Derndich, mm. which I've been wanting to get to her works forever. And this was, you know, the month that kind of prompted me to do that. And boy, it is a wonderful book, but talk about just a punch in the punch in the gut that subject matter is just rough and but yeah anyway it, it's i would go so far as to call it a masterpiece it's amazing so i'll just read a couple sentences of just the description it says haya, Dede- haya tedeschi sits alone in gorizia in northeastern italy surrounded by a basket of photographs and newspaper clippings now an old woman she waits to be reunited after 60, 62 years with her son fathered by an ss officer and stolen from her by the german authorities as part of himmler's clandestine project. So that's a very, you know, quick description. So it, it does start out that way, but then it jumps all over through through history. It includes a lot of, you know, photographs and lists of victims from some of the concentration camps. I mean, it is heavy going, but uh, she is such a really, you know, just the, the writing in it is amazing. And um, so this is one that I would heartily recommend to everyone, but just kind of brace yourself. It's it's not going to be an easy read by any means. And then another book that I read right around that same time, again, heavy subject matter, is one that I heard a lot about online, and it's called Minor Detail by Adanya Shibley. And that's translated by Elizabeth Jacquet. Before I go any further, I should take a step back and just mention that Trieste is translated from the Croatian by Ellen Elias Bursak. So I didn't mean to leave that out. Um, but yeah, jumping back to Minor Detail, by Adanya Shibley, translated by Elizabeth Jacquet. And this is one that, again, is is some pretty rough subject matter. Um, it says, This spare and haunting novel cuts to the heart of the experience of erasure, dispossession, and life under occupation in Pal- Palestine, and reveals the difficulty of piecing together the shards of a narrative concealed by a fragmented history. So it's a very slim book. You know, it's not barely 100 pages, but it's divided into two main sections. The first part takes place in the summer of 1949, and you are kind of moving around with um, a group of soldiers, and they're right on the border of what will be Israel and Palestine. So these Israeli soldiers attack a group of Bedouins in the desert, and there are some atrocities that take place there. And so that kind of takes up the first half of the book. And then we jump ahead quite a few years later to the present day, And there's a woman who comes across some details about those events, and she becomes interested and some would say probably obsessed with them and starts to go in and and research them. And she just gets pulled deeper and deeper into this event. So again, this one had been heavily heavily recommended by a lot of people to me, and I can see why it's it's really good. Um, And then just one more that I'll touch on, much lighter fare. Um, (laughs) This one comes from Charco Press, and it's called The Forgery by Ave Barrera, and it was translated from the Spanish by Ellen Jones and Robin Myers. I was recently able to uh, an attend a, an online event with the, the three of them that was hosted by Brazos Bookstores. And so I would absolutely, I would assume they probably have a recording. If anybody is interested, you should go check that out because it was really fascinating. It was the author, the two translators, and then a host from Brazos, and they were talking about this book. But yeah, this book is really fun. It's, like I said, much lighter than the other two books that I've mentioned. Um, But I'll just read the opening couple paragraphs just to give people a little taste because it's one of those that I challenge anybody to listen to this and not want to read, read on. It says, my name is Jose Federico Burgos. I'm a painter. I make copies of Renaissance paintings and the occasional forgery. I'm sitting on the edge of the highest wall on the property. I'm going to jump. I'm going to do it any second now. The dawn cold numbs my legs as they dangle over the abyss. The street lamps are starting to turn off as the sunlight peeps over my shoulder. Sunbeams cut through the haze lying over the hamlet. I hear a cockerel's cry, but it must be miles away. This yellow morning light might be the last thing I see. So that's how how it starts off. She drops you right in. But despite maybe the foreboding sense that you get from that first paragraph, it's actually... 
there there is some darkness, but a lot of it is is a lot more fun. It, it's definitely kind of a heist novel. There's art forgery and all kinds of things going on. So it's it's a lot of fun. I really burned right through that one. I had been reading, like I said, some pretty heavy stuff. And and this was a nice reprieve and something that I read just in a couple of days. So I've been kind of enjoying just exploring some of those books that have been sitting on my shelves. And, you know, the Women in Translation Month has been kind of a good prompt for me to to pick them up and read them. So it's been a lot of fun. That is cool. Speaking of uh, Michael Kitto, you know, who our, our new Patreon supporter, uh, he's reading that book this week. I uh, for, for, for listeners who don't know, on my Instagram, which is at MOOCs, M-O-O-K-S-E, I um, every Friday ask, hey, welcome to the weekend. What are you reading? And then I post what people put with the book covers and various things like that. And that's where Michael said that that's what he's reading this week. Oh, cool. So you got yeah, that's a lot of fun. You guys are in good company. <laughs> Very good company. Yeah. And like I said, if you get a chance, anybody to uh, either reach out to Brazos or, or try to find it online, if you can find that link, it's it's a really cool conversation between those three. A lot of insights and um, amazing because it was kind of co-translated by Ellen and Robin. And they talk about how that came about and the process of translation how it's very personal but at the same time you're collaborating with the author and now you're collaborating with the second translator and yeah i thought it was just a fascinating conversation so yeah but how about you trevor what have you been reading i have also been taking advantage of women in translation month because there are several books i mean i I just got the fernanda melkor books i -hmm. got the olga ravin books you know books you've recommended in the past and um not that i need an excuse to read them but it's kind of nice to say I don't have to read anything else right now. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. (laughs) Um, And the one that I'm reading right now is actually forthcoming from NYRB Classics. It comes out on September 6th. So pretty soon after this episode goes up, it's Polina Barskova's Living Pictures, uh, translated by Catherine uh, Siepiela, if I'm saying that right. (laughs) Any of those words, right? (laughs) I do think I said living pictures, right? (laughs) Um, uh, I just kind of pulled this one out because it's forthcoming, but also I thought, oh, and it's Women in Translation Month. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is, this is a really good book. It's, it's about, to an extent, it's about the Stalingrad blockade and, you know, in World War II. uh, And Barskova wasn't necessarily alive during that, but it's clearly still a big presence in the city in some ways. And in other ways, it's hidden. Like they don't have all of the same, you know, monuments and um, reminders and memories, but it, but it's there. And she kind of explores a lot of that. And I've, and it's not just that though. It, It is that, but she also is a poet. She, the last piece in this book, which I haven't quite gotten to yet, is written like a play. <laughs> and she's talking about her own life, her own autobiography. At the same time, some of the speakers in various parts are, are real historical figures. So fortunately, in the back, there is um, a section on with notes to help know some of these things. You know, the, In fact, the, the Forgiver, which is the second piece in it, in this essay, Barshkova speaks as a scholar who has done archival research on the siege of Leningrad. The central figure is Dmitry Maximov, a professor at Leningrad University who taught pre-revolutionary literature to Soviet students. And it just kind of gives you a little bit of a little bit of help. And then mm. this is kind of what I wanted to point out. It's not just about this stuff. The other key figure is Barshkova's birth father, Evgeny Rayan. Even or along with Joseph Brodsky, Rian was one of Akhmatova's orphans, a group of young Petersburg poets who began writing during the post-Stalin period without regard for Soviet censorship. And it's it's just pretty amazing all of the various threads that she's putting in here. Um, and then again, I think some of her fun with poet poetry, like it, it's mm-hmm. sometimes not punctuated the typical way, but certainly the way she thinks about things is not just, this is not just a documentary kind of book. There's a lot of feeling in here that you wouldn't get by just trying to describe things. Um, There's a part in the first essay called East Strangement. Um, uh, There's a section called Motion. It says, they ran and they walked, they crawled and they fell. 
One time I had to describe how people moved during the blockade. I confess I was unable to discover the right verb of motion. How did people move through the blockaded city during that deadly January, swollen, blinded, leaning on canes, passing by fellow human beings already turning into snowdrifts? How do you take account of their method of moving along when you're moving along a tour group of energetic young students? She's talking about visiting these places with students. Um, And then it kind of goes on a little bit, but I kind of like the way she ends this essay. It says, P.S. Now I think we don't need, I don't need, to move around the city at all. We need to enter the city and stand still and look for a long, long time. No need to rush anywhere. Look at the sky, the river, the restored walls, the grass, the admiralty spire, whatever you like. If we were in Berlin, a city saturated with memory, I think they long ago would have hung on every building that escaped destruction, photographs of these buildings as ruins, in their state of ruin. What more is there to say? All this is the blockade, which has exploded and collapsed into Haiti so many times, and which is now part of us forever. Um, that's just the first little little section of this. Wow. There's another one that I'm in the middle of right now called a gallery, which has like interesting things as if they're written by Picasso, whereas Duck is embarrassed by him and looking away. I mean, it's, it's got <laughs> weirdness in it, but in a yeah. fun way, I'm sure I'm missing a lot of, a lot of it, but really no. I recommend that one. That sounds really good. And it, as you were talking, it just did bring up a lot with Trieste, that book that I mentioned earlier. It sounds like there might be a lot of commonalities because it deals a lot also with the, some of those same issues, you know, that are common in books about war, but the idea of what happens after the war, this Trieste goes into some of the, like the SS officers and other people in the Nazi party, how some were, were punished, but other ones got away and lived relatively, you know, safe and comfortable lives. And it talks about, you know, the impacts on civilians and children and and how they try to build their lives after the war. So yeah, I guess we both covered some, some pretty, Rough ground, but in the hands of the right author, and it sounds like both of these books are that, it's it's amazing how it can still be very affirming at times and, and mm-hmm. positive and not ignoring the realities of war, but you know, there can be creativity and, and puzzles and different things as well. So yeah, I'm going to have to check that one out. You said it comes out September 6th. Yep. And, uh, and cool. it's part of the NYRB Classics Book Club. Oh, good. I think it's their October selection. Nice. Um, so you'll be getting a copy, I assume. I think you're still... Yeah. Still yep. in all that. Absolutely. <clears throat> all right, Paul. We blathered on enough. It's time to get to Cesar Ira. All right. I'm excited about this. Cesar Ira is one of my favorite authors. I love when his books arrive. Um, there are plenty of authors where I, I look forward to their books and I want to put things aside right when they come. But they, they I don't quite do that. With Ira, though... It shows up in the mail. I could be anywhere. It could be five pages from the end of a book. I'm putting that book aside to read nice. what Ira wrote. And one of the main reasons is they're all basically pocket sizes. I can get through mm-hmm. them in an hour or two. And mm-hmm. so it's very easy to do that, but always delightful, always surprising, and always familiar, which we'll get into here in a little bit. Ira is is as weird as he is, as, as many times as his books take hard left turns and leave you with a little bit of whiplash. <laughs> it's kind of like a big, big, big project with multiple um, angles approaching things like memory, apo- approaching things like identity, uh, mm-hmm. and approaching his very writing process itself and what his big project is. <laughs> his big project is to write about his big project, it turns out. <laughs> and it's a lot of fun if if you if you jump onto that wavelength, which uh, which I have. But I thought... We might as well start. I mean, as I said before, I've read um, all of his fiction that I think is available in English and love it. But I don't think that's what your experience has been. So I, I am curious where you're at in your IRA um, you know, journey. And yeah. if it is an IRA journey, are you like, I've read a couple, he's, it's not for me or what, you know, where are you? Right. Yeah, no, it's kind of fun because as we've mentioned before with these author episodes, we mentioned often there'll probably be a author where both of us have, you know, read most or, or all of their books and we consider mm-hmm. ourselves, you know, maybe not experts, but like we we're very knowledgeable. And then we mentioned there'll be other times where one or both of us might come into it fairly blind. And I think as far as I know, this is the first time that one of us has come that way because I 
had very, very little experience with Ira. I read an episode in the life of a landscape painter probably 10 or 15 years ago um, and really enjoyed it. But for whatever reason, just had not picked anything else mm-hmm. up by him in the last you know decade or whatever. And, and so now you could was... drown in that selection. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Meanwhile, he's been sitting idly waiting for me. No, he has been producing <laughs> what, two or three books a year. Um, yep. Yeah. So it's been really fun. Actually, I, I've enjoyed prompted by this. I have jumped in and over the last probably month, I've read three or four of his books and, and started to get an idea of some of those same things you were just talking about. The fact that they're so slight and covering a variety of topics and characters and even locations but reading some of them back to back like this, I started mm-hmm. to notice exactly some of the things you were talking about, some of those threads or oh. how you can feel familiar in a book that is continually wrong footing <laughs> you. But you're like, no, I know I, I start to recognize that it's still Ira and I don't know how that happens. I mean, it's it's there's a little bit of magic to it for sure. Um, yeah. But anyway, so I have I'll get into the details of which ones I've read. Mm-hmm. But over the last month, I reread an episode in the life of a landscape painter, which again, like I said, I'd read maybe 10 or 15 years ago. I reread that. And then I've read three other ones Okay. besides that. So yeah, no, it's been really fun. And, and it's been, it's one of those where you, there's an author like Ira who there's so much buzz about him and you, you're always hearing like people like you, Trevor, who are, are Mm -hmm. big fans. And it's always one of those where you're like, man, I need to read more of his, I need to read more of his, but just inevitably other things come up. And so yeah. I've appreciated this little prompt, kind of like we were talking about with Women in Translation Month. Sometimes you just need that gentle nudge to get you to do it. And I'm very happy that this has served that purpose. Well, and we put out a a little bit on Twitter asking people to tell us some of your experiences with Ira. And there are several people who haven't read him yet, but are intrigued. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Karen uh, from Barker uh, for Books said, I know nothing about him. So maybe this was even the first time it had come up for her in her reading. So she says, so I look forward to learning about him through your episode. Um, but there are other folks like Anthony Garrett, who said, I've wanted to be, and I'm assuming an Ira fan. I don't know exactly mm-hmm. what I wrote in the tweet, but mm-hmm. but haven't got there yet. This sounds amazing. So um, that is part of what I'm hoping we do here today is advertise Ira just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> and, and get some people who who maybe don't know where to start or have been intrigued, but you look at the list of what's available and, and you, you know, I know this, I, I look at it and I go, I don't want to start with the wrong one. Right. The one that I'm going to think, Oh, well, that's Ira. And then it turns out I, I didn't like it, but it's so, you know, it's, it's like his worst one, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'll never know that. So we'll give some thoughts on, on that. But ultimately again, most of his books are so short that it's, pretty pretty easy to to dive in um some other general thoughts we got from listeners um eric carl anderson at lonesome reader um great booktube follower or follow by the way really great Mm -hmm. says i really enjoy ira's novels their wonderful playfulness and probing thoughtfulness he's also a master of the short form novel i've not read any of his longer works but his style seems perfect for brief ecstatic hallucinations and i really like that word it's definitely right on Right on point. Um, and let's see here, a few other ones. Yeah, uh, our friend Kevin at Interpolations has asked me in the past which three Ira titles he should start with, and then he asked me again this time. He said, remind me, which what were they? And I put Were you consistent? Ones. Yeah. <laughs> well, I did put an episode in the life of a landscape painter on both of them. But otherwise, I the other two that I recommended is the, the, you know, the right places to start were both different books. And I thought they're both right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> these will these will all work. These will all work. Uh, so anyway, he he's there. There are plenty of fans, and maybe we'll get into some of their um, thoughts as well as we go forward here. But I do want to just let people know who, who don't know who Ira is yet a little bit about him. Mm-hmm. Um, he was born in 1949 in Cornell Pringles, and in you know kind of an outskirts of Buenos Aires. Uh, and in in Argentina, and this stuff about his childhood, about Argentina, about history there, about the Pampas, about Coronel Pringles, about his streets, mm-hmm. come up time and time again in his fiction. So in a way, I feel like I might know a little bit about him, and in another way, I'm like I have no idea what he is playfully putting out there that has no bearing whatsoever in reality. <laughs> right. Um, but 
you do get to know a little bit about him and you know he's he's what now if he was born in 49 73 years old because it's february 49 uh he has a great book called birthday and it's when he turns 50 he mm. he writes you know this book this this book about turning 50 and i love it and so i'm like oh you're getting older we're all getting older I, <laughs> I think that the the most recent one that came out, the famous magician. Let me look really quick. Um, it it also he seems to mark these kinds of events. Ah, here we go. Here's the beginning of the famous magician, translated by Chris uh, Andrews. A lot of his books are translated by you know a, a, a few different translators, but Chris Andrews is definitely one who translates a lot of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, here's how this one begins. One Sunday morning, when I had already passed the age of 60 and come to enjoy a certain renown as a writer, I was strolling through the book market in Parque Rivadavia, not looking for anything in particular, just enjoying the sunshine with no pressing tasks to fulfill or problems weighing in on my mind. And I'm like, well, that sounds great. Mm -hmm. I'm about to be knocked off my feet, probably. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) But listen to this. The sky was blue. The birds were singing. And the few trees left standing stood very still, as if frightened, each leaf precisely etched against the air. When I lowered my gaze to the earth and examined the labyrinth of green metal stands, I could see through the gaps in the park beyond the havoc wrought by the storm of the night before. (laughs) This this beautiful moment, you know, peaceful time. And then, lo and behold, it's all... You know, a big storm has gone through, knocked down hundreds, hundred year old trees lay strewn, piled one on top of the other, their branches and foliage promiscuously tangled, exhibiting roots that looked like gross earthen sculptures of spiders or squids. Likewise, the iron park benches had been thrown into heaps of up to 20, twisted out of shape and mangled together by the power of the storm. Even the marble and bronze statues had been blown off their pedestals, no doubt all at once by an irresistible gust, and they must have crashed together midair, to judge from the resulting blend of body parts, the breasts of a Venus plus the legs of a horse, with the three-cornered hat of a founding father, and other such weird chimeras half-buried in hillocks of mashed-up lawn. I heard one of the stallholders saying that the people living in the buildings opposite had filmed those apocalyptic dances and were uploading them to their Facebook pages. Using video editing software, they were inserting rabbits and ducks on the pretext that those little white figures would serve as points of reference. (laughs) I mean, again, think of where that paragraph started Mm -hmm. and where it ends. And the thing here, here goes the very next paragraph now. None of this was of much interest to me. My Sunday walk through the market, repeated over so many years, was part of my general fantasizing about books. (laughs) It's so Uh, weird, you know, but it's so fun. And I, I I loved the, the, the famous magician. Again, this is the most recent one to come out this month in this, in that big uh, new direction storybook form. Mm -hmm. It, it goes to millions of places. And one of the, you know, it, it plays as if this 60 year old, you know, author is Ira himself in a way. Mm -hmm. And it plays with his desire to keep on writing but not necessarily knowing what he should write next and not wanting to know because that's not, you know, that's not how he does it. He always wants to have some kind of idea that is fresh that he pursues and then just, and then the book is, is put together. And this is, this is really how Ira um, apparently writes a lot of his books. I'm not going to say all of them because I have no idea, but it's this thing called a flight forward or a fuga hacia adelante, the continual flight forward. I've heard, again, not that I know, but I have heard it from reliable people who have talked to Ira, you know, themselves. He basically goes into a cafe and writes for the day and deliberately tries to write some problems into the text, you know, some weird things like this storm, for example. I can see him thinking, okay, here you go. Figure this out, Ira, tomorrow. And so he comes into the coffee shop the next day and has to figure out how to work it out and develop something different. And it's just this, this, this fall forward, but amazingly, and I wouldn't want to read that kind of writing from anyone else. Yeah. Cause it would start to feel like mm-hmm. a creative writing. Like, you know, the teacher gives you a writing prompt and, yeah. and you do that and it could come across that way. But like you said, in, in the lesser hands or in the hands of a novice, it could get clunky or very predictable, but mm-hmm. somehow, <laughs> somehow, just, yeah. 
I mean, he's got a verve to his writing that I hope is shown a little bit in that passage that I just read from the famous magician. And the, his translators have been able to carry that over. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it's really, really, really frenetic, it, yeah. the, his books. I mean, they're, they're just buzzing. And uh, you can just get the sense of someone whose mind is always active and thinking about certain things. Because again, even though the the devices, you know, the storm or whatever, may be um, weird and, and surprising and you don't know exactly what's going on, he does have some lines of continuity. In fact, mm-hmm. w- one of my favorite books by him is The Literary Conference. Is that one that you've had a chance to read yet? It's not. It's I was going to mention some of the ones that I wanted to read next, and that's top of the list. Yeah, this one was translated by Catherine Silver. It's one of the earlier ones that we got. And part one is the Makuto line, which is this just really fun treasure chest. You know, it's like this line that comes out of the ocean. And people are trying to figure out how to f- figure out the puzzle so that when they open this thing, the treasure will be there and be safe. But there's also the danger of, of booby traps and you know ruining the treasure and all of this kind of stuff. And the, the first part of this whole section is uh, him getting there and trying to figure out how do I, um, you know, how do I uncover, how do I how do I look at this marvelous instrument, which is marvelous in and of itself that could both hide and recover the loot. You know, it's, it's an amazing treasure in and of itself, this Makuto line, and you're using it to figure out what is covered and what can be uncovered in the treasure. And I just keep on thinking, this is, I think, I think an analog to some of his work, Mm -hmm. you know, in, in that, the literary conference. Well, as I was reading some of his books, I noticed there was, in several of the books I read, there were these little passages that as I was reading, I was like, you know what, that sounds a lot like a description of either his philosophy mm-hmm. or a description of his works. And so there was one I was reading in Varamo. Yeah. Um, do you remember that one? And oh. I think he's talking about this guy's um, train of thought as he's playing dominoes, I think is actually what he's talking about. But to me, it sounded a lot. It sounded very familiar. See what you think. It says, the thread is sinuous and long. The concept slippery. The meaning's elusive. But the reconstruction is not, in fact, all that difficult if it is carried out step by step. One only has to allow the order of the thoughts, and there's no way to go wrong because each thought emerges from its predecessor as if in numerical sequence. And I thought, wow, that is a great description because if you start to think of how many things are covered in one of these 80 or 100 page books, it's like, how does that make any sense? But as it said there, if you follow it in order there is actually some logic or some connections that you can make as you, as you go through it. So I thought that was interesting. And then if you'll permit me, there's Mm -hmm. another similar section that I found in the divorce and it says, um, just so weird. I love that one. (laughs) Oh my gosh. That one was the first one I read in this after rereading the land, you know, the landscape, (laughs) I was like, wow. Um, So this is just really brief, but it said it had been an odd and memorable experience of the kind that leaves a very precise impression. Perhaps that was the only way she thought to enrich one's life. And that odd and memorable experience of the kind that leaves a very precise impression, I thought was another interesting, because again, these are so, I don't mean messy in a bad way, but messy in, in that they're all tangled up with each other. But when you finish these books, each one leaves a very precise impression, which I think is pretty fascinating Mm -hmm. considering everything that goes on within them. So, yeah, those were just two little bits. As I was reading, I was like, put a star next to it. I'm like, (laughs) you know what? That either purposefully, probably purposefully, or at the very least in my own mind, that sounds exactly like what I'm reading right now. Yeah, he does that a lot, I think. There's one story called The Little Buddhist Monk that... It's just filled with little passages like that. This monk that that is tiny, um, mm-hmm. who just keeps on finding himself in different stories almost, and it's like this is this is what you're doing to us too. You know, Are, am I the little Buddhist monk? Maybe right? I don't know. Yeah. Um, but bringing up Varamo uh, or Varamo, this is one. I'd read this after probably four or five of his other ones. It came out in 2012 in English. It's a 2002 novel by Ira himself. So, you know, back when he turned out, uh, you know, it was in his early 50s. And mm-hmm. I put on here just a little bit about my my own journey with Ira. I said, my first venture with Ira was with a landscape painter through Argentina in the 19th century. 
And that is an episode in the life of a landscape painter, which, you know, we'll talk about probably a little bit more in detail here in a second as we, as we start to settle on particular books and whatnot. And then I said, I've been with him in the skeleton of a haunted condominium that is being constructed. I've been with him on a trek to clone Carlos Fuentes. That's the literary conference, by the way. Okay. You've got to read that wow. one, Paul. No, no, seriously. <laughs> to a sunlit ice cream parlor where the ice cream or where the strawberry ice cream contains arsenic. <laughs> that is in how I became a nun. Mm. <clears throat> it's one of the weirdest, most kind of creepy fun uh, openings to a book I've ever read. Uh, I've been with him on a windy trip to Patagonia. That one is the seamstress and the wind. In Var- Varamo, Ira takes us to Colón, Panama in 1923, where we go through a rather eventful night with a lowly government clerk. You know, that just sounds so fun, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but the reason I bring this one up, I-, I was having a Twitter exchange with Ben O'Connell, who had just finished Ghosts, and kind of asked me, you know, did D- 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 these books seem to take a lot of hard left turns. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was like, yes, that, that's exactly right. Um, kind of asked me how I feel about some of that. And I said, oh, you know, the books are so short. I usually get through them in a burst. I mean, I, I just I read them kind of, kind of fast. However, it's not uncommon for me to feel like I was not fully conscious in sections. And he said, oh, that's a good description. Dream logic is too often abused, but it may be apt here. And that's why I wanted I wanted to kind of lay that as a foundation for my experience starting Varamo that night when I got home from work. I began reading this book just before going to sleep. I was very tired, and soon I was reading the same sentence over and over, though my mind seemed to keep the story going forward. Eventually, I woke myself up enough to put the book down. The next morning, I couldn't help but chuckle about where my mind had drifted the night before, this book about a lowly government clerk, um, and I had gone to some taxidermist executing his plan to pose a fish playing a piano, um, you know, only quite a ways into the project, realizing that fish anatomy doesn't suit playing a piano. <laughs> and I was like, that is a really weird dream. Thanks, Ira, for, you know, kind of getting my mind going. And then I stopped and thought, wait a minute. What if that's what Ira actually wrote <laughs> in, in Varamo? And it is. I yeah. I said, you already know, of course, that I wasn't dreaming. <laughs> Such hilarious. is the joy, the joy of reading a work by Cesar Ira. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, that book is, is crazy. I mean, they all are. But I was laughing about this book because the very beginning of it, you know, within the first page, it's talking about how this lowly, like you said, government worker ends up with these, you know, counterfeit bills and then somehow this prompts him and he ends up writing like one of the most acclaimed poems, you know, <laughs> that everybody just loves. And, and so you think that's what this book's going to be around. And he mentions, you know, the poem on the first page or two. And then I read and I read and I read and I yep. kept reading yep. and I was like 80 pages in and I'm like, they barely even <laughs> mentioned anything about this poem. And I noticed that the number of pages that are left is steadily shrinking. And I was like, the whole thing that I thought this book was going to be about was like the composition of this poem or how it was like inspired or prompted. He spent this night, like, you know, just writing this poem furiously or something like that. No, like he mentions it again, very near the end, but it's hilarious. Like talk about throwing your expectations for a loop. Yeah. And we talk about like, we're, I'm giggling. I I do love that part of his work. I love how playful it is. And I feel like he is playing with me, not against me or showing off in weird ways that aren't meant to entertain and to help me as a reader. I feel like he's very approachable. Yeah. Um, I was noticing that. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but uh, there's an interview in Bomb magazine Mm -hmm. and it says Cesar Ira's body of work is a perfect machine for invention. He writes without necessity or any apparent forebears, always as if for the first time. I like that part. Um, And then there's an interview with him and it says, At times, you've said that you write certain things, quote, because they sound good. Are you really interested in plot? And he says, what I meant to say is that I've never been interested in the sensuality of words. In fact, what I write is in the clearest, most neutral tone possible. I try to make my prose almost transparent. In the long run, that can create a style and a type of sensuality in the cadence, in the rhythm of the writing. And I just thought that was an interesting insight on top of this whole approach that he takes of kind of falling forward or however you want to say it. If you think about it, 
a lot of his prose is fairly, he says, the clearest, most neutral tone possible. I mean, for how weird it is and how you think of some of the places he takes you, if you break it down to the actual language, it's not overly <clears throat> flowery or ornate. For the most part, it's fairly straightforward. It's just this almost like this engine that's driving you forward. Yeah. That's um, a good way which of I thought, it. yeah, I hadn't thought about it until I read that interview and I was like, Oh, because if, if I hadn't thought about that, I would have said, Oh yeah, no, he, he takes you off on these crazy flowery descriptions and you know, all this stuff, but you know, I'm sure there's exceptions, but for the most part, a lot of the writing itself is fairly straightforward. It's just the subject matter. And, and like you said, the left turns that he takes you on. So yeah. it's really fascinating. And he can really string a sentence together. Like that's where I think a lot of his writing skill beyond the mm-hmm. intellect behind it, there is a, like when I was reading the beginning of this, the famous magician, it's hard not to just keep reading it faster and faster and faster and faster because he's stringing together long sentences. And then the next one is tied into that. He's, he is a very good writer that way. Again, it doesn't show off because you're just along for the ride. But I think that that's fair to say that it isn't so much flowery language or flowery descriptions all that often. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think he may be like being a little bit modest. I, I do find his writing to often be quite um, striking. Oh, yeah. Uh, not just in the frenetic movement forward, but in the some of the times that it makes you stop moving and go, whoa, that is a beautiful description of your childhood or of this memory or of memory itself you know mm. so no for sure so let, let's look at some of the listener feedback that we got because th- there is a lot and i i gotta apologize maybe a little bit to listeners I, I did think oh maybe we just go through his his pieces in order and i give you my thoughts on them but i thought that no that's kind of boring you know just to hear oh yeah i like that one um you know so this is a little bit of a slapdash thrown together in a random way episode, but I think we'll settle here in a minute and start talking about some of our favorite things and using passages from them. But I do want to show some thoughts from other listeners. Uh, we have Platonov's Pit. This is uh, um, on, on Twitter. <laughs> he said he finished Ira's The Famous Magician yesterday and that loved it. The way Caesar's wife rescues his imagination is laugh out loud, funny and skillful. The imagination is so powerful. It sometimes needs reining in. Do you ever feel like sometimes he might would do like produce something more meaningful if he reined it in a little bit in what you've read? Um, I don't know. It's funny because I think, to be honest, some of that playfulness might have been what kept me from diving back in. Because as much as I enjoyed The Landscape Painter, that one, for the most part, was not quite as playful. I mean, there were moments, but everybody's descriptions of some of his other works, I was like, I don't know if that's necessarily for me because Mm -hmm. it just seems like, you know, you hear the word whimsical and that can, that can be good, but that can also, at least for me, you know, raise some red flags. And so I think in theory, that would be a concern for me, but as I've read him for the most part, I would not say that that has ever caused any issues for me. Actually, I think because he'll drop in other stuff that, you know, kind of, it's not just light and fluffy by any means. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? So I think yeah. if it, if he had gone too far that way, like I was thinking there was this one section to go back to Veramo. He says, like all adults, he was afraid of accidents. What dismayed him most about them was the temporal contrast between the instant or fraction of an instant in which an accident could occur and the long months or years required to repair its effects. If indeed they were reparable and didn't last a lifetime. And so like stuff like that, you're like reading this kind of like crazy adventure or whatever. And then all of a sudden you hit a section like that and it's like, wow, Mm -hmm. it just takes your breath away. So I think, yeah, I do think that that was something that might've been a little bit of a concern for me, but the more of his work I've read over the last couple of weeks, I've realized there's a lot more to it than just that. Yeah. And I, I, I am glad that you've had that experience because I kind of get, get where this is coming from. And I don't even think that based on other conversations I've had with Platonov's pit, (laughs) Mm -hmm. I I don't think he necessarily is saying that as a, as a criticism so much as a, wow, you know, it's so powerful. It sometimes needs reining in Yeah, Um, for all I know he's saying, and he does a great job doing just that, you know, clearly, but you're exactly right. There have been so many of these where I'm reading it and I'm thinking, I don't even know what's going on. I'm loving the experience. 
and then something comes to me because he he starts to not tie it together. I don't think that's what he's interested in, but the impressions start to to reverberate with one another in my brain. It's like it's like starting to form constellations that start to make sense in a way. Yeah, and I I do you know I don't read him just for the comedy. I read him because it's so powerful to read about those linden trees in his book uh, about his childhood in Cornell Pringle Pringles. It's a funny book and there's a lot of interesting things going on in it, but I love the, the exploration of these images and what do we remember and how do we remember? Mm -hmm. And then kind of emphasizing that by showing how bizarre our minds can be and the way that we remember things or think of people um, you know, and he's, uh, and it, it is more serious than that. For example, Ghost, is that one that you have, have had a chance to read yet? It is. Yeah. Okay. So this one's maybe not quite as playful as some of it's not, it doesn't take as many weird turns, but it is still weird. I mean, the, this, it's a bunch of people who are living in a condominium that's being constructed and mm-hmm. it happens to be haunted. There are ghosts there and these ghosts do all kinds of things. They're not necessarily, um, uh, scary ghosts who are threatening, but they represent things that are threatening. And not only that, but the there's more to this that he's going into. And we got a really good tweet from Paul Sweeney about ghosts. He says, the view from the economic edges of every city being constructed. Loved it. Should resonate with all the Irish that worked on building sites in the 1980s. And I just like how he's talking about, th- there's so much going on here that is that is about these people and about all people who are in this situation, but he does it in a whimsical fun way, but he has drop dead serious moments in a lot of these, not all the time. Cause that's not his whole project. Again, his whole no. project is his whole project, you know, all of his books and they, they're very, they're very wide and varied. He has books about all kinds of different time periods. He has pastoral novels. He has these really funky novels about his own youth where he changes gender from time to time. You know, it, it's just, there's so much going on in all of these, but there is, there's an intellect that is serious and reflective in all of this. He's not just telling jokes. No, absolutely not. Yeah. I, I liked that point about focusing in on this family, because as you said, they're there, it's a worker's family that's basically living in this, you know, building as it's being constructed. And so at the beginning, it kind of touches on some of the people who are visiting, you know, the the big wigs of the construction company and some of the people who are going to be moving in. And you think maybe that's what this book is going to be focusing on is these people <clears throat> moving in the building. Mm-hmm. But after that initial intro, it steps back and you spend almost the entire novel with the family of, I guess, you know, I don't know if they're squatting or if they're supposed to be there, but they're they're living there in the I construction. I think they're squatters, but yeah, maybe I'm I wrong. Yeah, are. And so it's it's just time with them as they're getting together as a family and eating meals and they're, you know, the kids are like treating this giant scaffold of the building as a as a playground and taking naps and all these things. So it's it's really interesting. Like you said, once again, those where you think it might be going in the beginning gets thrown for a loop very quickly. Um, yeah, there was a section you talked about how well he does childhood. Um, the, the children who are living in that building as, as it's being constructed, they will play there. I mean, there's no guardrails on the sides and there's a lot of conversations about, you know, the parents, you'd be surprised, but they actually weren't that concerned that they're going to fall off the side. Cause they're like, well, we're, we don't fall off the side. Why would our kids fall off the side and mm-hmm. uh, all that? So th- these kids are often just playing, playing hide and seek and things. And so there's this part where they're playing with their little plastic cars in the building. And I just thought it was a really nice evocation of, of childhood. So I'll just read a, a quick snippet. It says they had a number of little plastic cars. Their childish instincts had alerted them to the silence below where the builders had stopped working, so they ventured down the stairs to the sixth floor, and then to the fifth. The cars went down the stairs in little hands and parked in the farthest rooms, excited to have the whole building to themselves, or at least the upper floors. The children complicated their game, leaving a car on one floor and going down to the next, then coming back up to look for it, taking unfamiliar routes. A building site was the least appropriate place for a car race, although ideal for hide-and-seek, and yet the adverse conditions made the game special, giving it a novel, impossible flavor, which made them forget everything else. They felt they had gone straight to the heart of truth or art. And I was like, oh, that part, I don't know. It's just, 
my wife grew up on a lot of construction sites because her dad was an electrician. And she talks about when she was a kid, a lot of times, like on a Saturday, she, her dad would be working and she would just end up exploring through these construction sites and just using some of the different materials she found to like, <laughs> you know, play and, and keep herself occupied. And it kind of reminded me of that, of just that idea of when you're a kid, all these landscapes, you get thrown into this environment and you just make the most of it and turn it into a game. And I love that idea of like, leave a car on a different floor and then they take a completely different route to go back and find it. And just the creativity and kind of the boredom of childhood. I thought that was a really beautiful passage. Yeah, it, it, it really is awesome. And he's written about similar things. I mean, this isn't a construction site, but there's Shantytown. Um, it's, I think it, let's see here. When did Shantytown? It was written in 2001. So about 10 years after he wrote Ghost, it came out in a, it, it, from New Directions in 2013. And it's about a Shantytown. You know, there's a lot more going on. And he always has these funky little, like almost genre things, like a corrupt trigger happy policeman will use anyone including two innocent teenage girls to break up a drug ring that he believes is operating within Buenos Aires's famed shanty town. And as I look back on it, I'm like, that's not what I got out of this at all. I think that's <laughs> right. probably one of those things like Var- Varamo is a famous, you know, poet now, and, <laughs> you know, it's just yeah. there, but it, but it's, it's kind of there. And, and when I was writing about it, one of the things I've loved about reading a lot of Ira over time is it's still I'm still figuring out what he's doing for me. And this is what I wrote back in 2013. He said, Cesar Ira is a mad scientist. His short books are seemingly pieced together from segments of other novels, creating a Frankenstein of a story. Somehow, though, he sends a bolt of lightning through it and it haltingly comes to life. I've, um, you know, I'm, Shantytown, the reason I put that is that this book about that that I just read you and about Shantytown is one of these that has a bunch of crazy threads that somehow come together, mm-hmm. even if they don't, <laughs> which just works in his yeah. greater project. So there's there's just so many riches here. And again, I'm glad they're short. Um, I tended to like his shorter books more than his longer books. I was going to mention that. I know you mm-hmm. said that. And, and as you were talking about some of the the playfulness and and whether or not he needs to be reined in. Do you think there's any self reining or do you think that there's a method to his madness for writing smaller books where he kind of goes off on these experiments and then kind of realizes that that's the end of this one. And I'm going to move on to another one. Like I just, I wonder Mm -hmm. about that because to me it has some similarities, how we've talked about with short stories, how an author might feel a little bit of a freedom where they can just pursue an idea or a character and it doesn't have to have a clean start and it doesn't have to have a clean ending. You know, I just wonder if there's something to that. Like you mentioned a mad scientist that's like their little experiments. You throw a bunch of stuff together and see what happens and then you move on. So I don't know. I just thought that that whole idea of the length is an interesting perspective to look at him through. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of times he gets to, you know, 80, 90 pages of, of what would be 80, 90 pages and says, oh, I guess that that's where this one is is done. But at the same time, and especially after reading and listening about, you know, interviews where he's talking about this um this falling forward, you know, the mm-hmm. the this this style of writing, I've had to take a little bit of that with a grain of salt. Yeah. Because they do come together in way I mean, I'm like, you are either one of the most brilliant minds out there to take a bunch of narratives and somehow meld them into into a, a theme that does work or it's not quite that simple you know you are doing mm-hmm. more work here than it than you might be letting on but at the right. same time he is writing lots of books at once he he really might just have that mind that he, that he can he it is working together and making connections, you know, firing up, sign up, you know, to boom, 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 or around right. his head as he's writing. And then it just kind of flows out of him and he trusts it. And I've certainly learned to trust him too. Mm-hmm. No, I think that's a good way of putting it. And that's something that I, like I said, I think that's what's happened with me over the last couple of weeks is learning to trust him because as I said, after that long hiatus mm-hmm. and, and maybe a little bit warily, not that I I mean, I trust you and I trust a lot of people who are big fans, but I was just, I think maybe afraid that it wouldn't work for me. 
And so as you start to read, it doesn't take very long before you start to pick up on little things. And then if you read one back to back to back, like I did, um, that trust starts to build. And like you said, it's that whole idea of just knowing you're in the hands of a master. Even if it takes you a while to figure out what he's doing, you know, there probably is something going on that you haven't picked up on yet. So, yeah. Um, did you, you said the divorce is one that you've read. I mean, since I've, that's mm-hmm. the other one that I've read recently. I don't know if you had any, if you wanted to just touch on that one a little bit. I mean, that one was. It requires faith whew, in, in Ira. Yeah. It does. I think that was the first one I read in this after having reread I, Landscape. I and I didn't want to say anything. I knew that you were like, oh, I'm going to read the divorce next. And part of me was like, ah, mm-hmm. I don't, that one's a little <laughs> bit, you know, you, you might have moments where you're like, what the heck am I doing here with yeah. this Ira fellow? Because I love the individual pieces of that. I love the little miniature building and the, that escape from the fire oh and all God. that. It's so yeah. fun. But I can definitely see looking back on it and thinking, so what? So what, right. Ira? Um, right. So I was a little bit wary that, that you went there, but I didn't want to say, no, Paul. No, my son. <laughs> right. Thou shalt go, you know, because that's silly. Um, and I, I was kind of curious how you would respond to it being your, you know, kind of refresher, get back into Ira mode. Yeah. I mean, it took me a while for sure, but I think I've talked about this in the past. I think one thing that I've learned with certain authors, um, you know, I think like James Joyce, for example, is one that comes to mind where I've talked about how you just kind of relax and let the flow carry you and you don't get hung up on every little detail and stopping to make sure you have it all figured out. I think that, you know, worked well for me here because it was kind of one of those things where you're just along for the ride and you are making connections as you go. But there are times where you're like, I have no idea what he's doing here, why he's doing it, but I'm just going to trust him and keep going. And so yeah. I do think that served me well. And that's definitely something that I, I did with this one. Um, yeah, just a, such an interesting book because, again, you start out with this this main character and he's talking about how he's traveled due to his divorce and he's, he's, you know, in another country <laughs> and all this stuff. And then like, you think, okay, once again, like, okay, that's what this is about. And then you quickly, you know, meet about three different characters within about three different pages. And there's like this interesting framework, but then he's sitting there at, at dinner, I think it is. And, and it's pouring rain <laughs> and this guy gets soaked. And all of a sudden he looks up after he's been soaked and he recognizes his dinner partner and that. Oh, takes off look this. At us. <laughs> yeah. They're off on like their school trip. And like you said, then that goes into this weird, like their school starts on fire and there's some, like <laughs> it almost reminded me of Milhauser where, you know how he gets yeah. into some of those stories where there's like the miniaturist where he keeps exploring smaller and smaller worlds. And he kind of gets lost in that. And there's this whole model of the school building during this fire and I guess my understanding is they escape the real fire <laughs> through the model. But yeah. Then that model is also on fire. And it's, it's, so it's, it's this whole idea of like, reprieve. <laughs> yeah. So it's almost, I don't know if it's an alternate dimension or if they're literally supposed to be like inside of this scale model. But yeah, it, that was one part where I was just going to bring up Milhauser, where in that particular story, and I think to some degree in other parts, there's some of his playfulness and, you know, how Milhauser will take you places you didn't necessarily expect to go. You know, I'm not saying it's a direct correlation between the two, but I thought there was some of that interesting playfulness there too. So, yeah, but, uh, you know, I don't even really know what I want to say about the divorce other than just I <laughs> wanted to talk about it because it's one of those where I'm just like, it is so weird and so much fun. Again, 80, no, 98 pages. And within those 98 pages, you explore in depth at least probably three or four different characters or flashbacks or different things. And yeah, yeah. So weird. And important moments of their lives where they were mm-hmm. together and where it seemed like those relationships would be just, you know, stuck, but they've drifted yeah. away. And the, it's only in these, you know, these, the moment of the, the cyclist falling where some of this comes back to mind, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I do think that this one, I, I put it in my review, I'm not sure what to make of the divorce as a whole. <laughs> is it just a collection of fun stories that look um, that, or that play together in unique ways? Is it a larger statement on the structures we inhabit and how they affect reality in quotes? Um, it could be all of the above and more. What I do know is that it's fun and provocative and I'm always hungry for more Ira. <clears throat> but 
there are some fun things here where at the beginning where the man is divorced, he, he's from Rhode Island and mm-hmm. he's just decided I'm going to go to Buenos Aires. I need some space and it's probably good for my, my wife and daughter if I get some space too. And he says, in the absence of significant others, I had the liberating sensation of being absent from myself. Mm-hmm. I think there's a key in that line to what Ira is doing as he explores these past stories that are bizarre and absurd and definitely changed in the mind and changed in the memory that seem to flash through that crazy mind in one moment um, as we go through this. But but it is bizarre. And and some of the stories I liked more than others, like I loved the, the escape from the school story, mm-hmm. but I, I think that some of the other ones I was like, oh, I don't. I don't know what what we're getting at here, and right. I'm okay with that. It might not be as fun or as meaningful to me as a lot of the other stuff that I've I've read by you, but um, but I, yeah. I'll, I'll give you those twenty pages that didn't do it for me. You know, <laughs> that's right. Well, I was reading the New York Times review of of divorce, and I thought it was really good. It says reading Ira can feel like being inside a picture, sliding from one plane of color to another, only to find yourself following a figure that suddenly slips outside the frame. Modes of seeing, paintings, mirrors, silhouettes, shadows, figure prominently in the divorce, which slides, oh, I don't know how to, vertiginously, there you go, between (laughs) the mundane and the fantastical, delighting in, quote, the bafflement produced by doublings and parallel universes. A school engulfed in flames is preserved in all its detail as, quote, a translucent edifice of dark moth wings that remains in place after the building has collapsed. Members of a society devoted to Charles Darwin come to realize that, Quote, the whole world might be one giant evolution club within which theirs was a scale model. A sculptor's fumbling gestures produce a fretwork of shadows that become his abused apprentice's private secret work. As in earlier novels like Ghosts and the Hare, Ira captures the texture of the world by flying away from it. Rather than a rejection of reality, his dreamlike sequences are an acknowledgement of it, confirming, had there been any doubt, that there is no other world than this. So I thought, when you were saying that, that, that kind of reminded mm-hmm. me of that. I thought that was really good. And I liked that idea of feels like being inside of a picture sliding from one plane of color to another. Cause as I was reading him, I was trying to figure out what I would use for like a description of what it's like to read him. And so during different books, one, I had a few different things. I was curious, Trevor, if you have any ideas. So when I was reading the divorce, I kept thinking of Russian dolls because I felt like, mm-hmm. you know, each time there was like a story within a story. I liked that idea of the sliding glass. And then I know just having read some um, reviews of, of some of his books, a bicycle wheel, there's the spokes of the wheels coming out. I've, I've seen that description. Another one that I thought about after reading um, an episode in the life of a landscape painter was lightning. Mm-hmm. I thought there was something to be said for lightning because mm-hmm. you're, you're going along and everything's serene all of a sudden this bolt from on high hits you and completely changes your life or changes the story. So those were just a few, you know, I thought it was kind of fun just to think of some of the different ways as I was reading him that I might use to describe his work. And I really like the sliding doors analogy because that is how I feel about my experience with him. I read an episode of the life of landscape painter and I have one sliding glass, you know, right in front of me. Mm-hmm. And then I read ghosts and another picture slides in and it works with the other one, but adds different things and even takes mm-hmm. away other things. And over time, there's just a lot more to it. You know, I, I like that a lot. And I also like the lightning bolt analogy there of what he does. There's there's one book that I, I, I love, Dinner. Um, okay. I don't know if it's one that you've even had on your radar necessarily. It came out in 2015. It's, it's one he wrote in 2006, translated by Catherine Silver. And it's just, it's so, it, there's a sophisticated playfulness to his work that I, I just think he's often exploring the strange life we live inside of our head and playing mm-hmm. with form and different genres to do this. And here we have Dinner, which takes us back to uh, Coronel Pringle's place of Irish childhood, you might start to think, oh, this is a book about memory, um, but it's transmitted through years of dreams and nightmares. And here we have some people sitting down for dinner. And <laughs> it's just so funny because the narrator doesn't associate faces with people. And he's never been able to really do that. And and his memory, therefore, is faulty. It's like all of a sudden we have someone who must not be like Ira. Um 
because he, he can't remember, can't connect things. And I'm sitting there thinking as I'm reading this, and I, I, most of the time with these books, I know where I was when I was reading them because mm-hmm. it's just an experience. So I was visceral. walking, yeah, I was walking around the, our, our cemetery here in town when I'm reading this, and I'm thinking, oh, this is just really interesting. You know, where is he going to go with this? Zombies. Zombies are going to come and attack. That's we're going to. It's going to turn into this madcap race through the town, like uh, seamstress in the wind, or like literary conference where they're running from silkworms, giant cloned silkworms. It's so funny. And this one has zombies in it, and it's so fun and so weird. And there I am in the cemetery. Well, here's here's what I'm reading here. The news team were on their way to the cemetery because they'd been told that the dead were rising from their graves of their own accord. This is this was as improbable as an adolescent fantasy. It was, however, true. <laughs> All the dead are coming up, you know, and, you know, they're coming to dinner. <laughs> so it's just That's so hilarious. It's so fun. But again, there's something going on here. And it usually takes me um, a while and maybe even a reread before I'm like, how does this all fit together? Maybe it doesn't, but how am I going to make it fit together? Because I do believe there's connections and ways to, Mm -hmm. to, to have, you know, that kind of fun. It's a puzzle. It's yeah, it's, it's, it's a blast to do this. I just love it. I can't wait for the next one to come out. I can't. I just, I wish it were out right now. Yeah, no, I can absolutely see that. Well, I was going to ask you, I mean, we didn't really touch on um, Mm -hmm. Landscape Painter yet. I know that that was probably, as we were asking people for their favorites, that one, I wouldn't say, I don't know if it came up the most, but it came up probably most consistently. Yeah. And especially as a starting point, if we were going to suggest a book to start with for people who haven't read it, is that the one that you would go to? That's the consistent one I always tell people, partially because it's my own starting point, but also... And sorry about my dog, everybody. My parents are in town. My dog does not like my dad. <laughs> oh, family <laughs> so, conflict. So there we are. Um, but I think it's one that is very approachable and subtly starts to undercut itself, and therefore mm-hmm. you, as the narrator with, or sorry, as the reader with expectations of to the, of the story, I think it's a little bit. And it's kind of one of his more pastoral novels, so I feel it's more familiar. I would not want someone to start with a divorce because I think they might have fun with it, but in the end be like, but there's nothing to that. Yeah. Where I think that's wrong. I just, you know, I think that requires some more of those sliding glasses to be in place before its picture makes a little more sense and seems to fit. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's right. Well, I thought if, you know, we have a few minutes left, I thought it might be fun just to share. We had asked people just for some other thoughts Mm -hmm. on, on their favorites. And we got some really varied um, (laughs) comments, which I think is interesting because there were some common threads, but it was amazing how many different favorites there were, which I think says a lot about the power of his work. So I thought we could just maybe read a couple of those, you know, Sebastian Castillo. I love the literary. Yeah. The literary conference is the first IRA I read and remains my favorite. I've read all that are available in English. Other favorites include Veramo, Shantytown, The Miracle Cures of Dr. Ira, and The Linden Tree. And he has a nice anecdote where he says, I got to see him read at his first, and I believe only, U.S. reading. It was a special night. Uh, Cecil Taylor was in attendance. And so, said, so really quickly, oh one yeah. of Ira's most famous short stories is called Cecil Taylor. And so that's okay. what Sebastian is talking about here. It's, it's in the musical brain, this collection mm-hmm. of short stories put out by New Directions in a lovely hardback. So that's that's why it's significant that Cecil Taylor is in attendance at at this reading. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, so it's just a really cool. It, it looks like it was back in 2018, and he posted it on Facebook. And Trevor, I don't know if you wanted to just describe it since you've read the book and have a little bit more perspective on what it means. Yeah, it's really cool. I'm really jealous, actually, Sebastian. This is something I would have loved to have been a part of. But the thing that I I really love is that Sebastian gets there a little bit early, and sit, sits by an elderly African American man. And doesn't realize it, but that's Cecil Taylor, <laughs> this famous oh, wow. jazz musician. It's it's so fun. And so he's sitting there um, going through this. And and Ira, I believe, it looks like read from Cecil Taylor and talks about that. And there's a really nice picture that Sebastian put there, too, of mm-hmm. Ira going up to Cecil Taylor afterwards, holding his hand and giving it a, giving it a kiss, you know, and greeting. Um, this is a great story and kind of, I think pulls a lot of this together. Ira is interested in art 
He's interested in literature, but also art and music. And all of these things play a role in his, in his ultimate project again. You know, it is a bigger thing. And I think that this, this story about Cecil Taylor, kind of a misunderstood, um, you know, young artist that people don't particularly know how to deal with it, but there are a few people who get it. I'm not saying Ira thinks that's him. I just think Ira thinks that's interesting. How do we respond to art? How do we start to get it? How do we start to recognize it as meaningful when at first there is no apparent meaning? It's unfamiliar. Um, There's no bearing to it. There's no ground to stand on. And then lo and behold, eventually a generation may come along that they're, they start to put some frameworks down on the floor to give you some ground to stand on. And it becomes, wow, this is a masterpiece. Un- yeah. Misunderstood at the time. Again, I'm not saying that's Ira talking about his own work. I think it's him talking about part of his project is exploring how we approach these things, how we approach our own minds, how we how we are affected by the art that we we consume, how we thirst for more, how we um, start to gain some kind of an understanding about all of this, even if it's a misunderstanding about what we're we're putting together and Cecil Taylor the story I think is is a, a nice framework for a lot of that. So Sebastian, thanks so much for sharing that that anecdote with us. Yeah. I thought that was awesome. No, that's wonderful. And that what you just said reminded me of something else that I read in one of those interviews. It says Ira's creative approach has never changed. He reads exhaustively every author in every genre from every period in every country mm-hmm. as if it were possible to process it all. Yeah. And I like that. As if it were possible to process it all. Like that that hunger and that excitement if just you can't take it all in but you want to do your best to try it so i talked about in our episode about new directions with mark haber when i got to to go and have uh, lunch with uh, barbara epler and laurie callahan at new directions and i can't remember how long it had been but barbara had fairly recently gotten back from a trip to argentina to meet ira oh wow and sh- she just said it was crazy because he had he'd be like oh we got to go see this and they'd get in a taxi and drive over there to see this museum and he's just basically running through it just looking at oh, look at that look at that look isn't it amazing <laughs> and then they get into a taxi to go somewhere else and it's just one thing after another and he is enjoying it he is experiencing it he's not just like oh look that way look that way he is part of the 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 thing and he is you know having a delightful time and she said it was it, it it was frenetic, you know, just kind of that yeah. word that I've used to describe his novels at times, you know? So yeah, he, he has that attention span. It seems like a lack of attention span, but it isn't. He's, he Mm-mm. is imbibing it all and, Amazing. and pulling all this stuff in. Yeah. You know, at the very end of, of that, at the very end of that description, it says Ira likes it all and writes accordingly. I think that's great. <laughs> he likes it all and he writes accordingly like that. That's a great summary. So yeah, well, well I mean, I, oh, go ahead. Well, look at what's coming out next for New Directions. Uh, it comes out next March, and it's called Fulgentius. It's translated by Chris Andrews, and says in, in Ira's new novel, Fulgentius, a 67-year-old imperial Roman general, Rome's most <laughs> illustrious and experienced, is sent to pacify the remote province of Pannonia. He is a thoughtful, introspective person, a Saturnine intellectual who greatly enjoys being on the march away from his lovely, loving family and the sometimes deadly intrigues of Rome. Fulgentius is also a playwright, you know, bringing in this artist angle, mm-hmm. though of exactly one play. <laughs> There's Varamo again. Um, and in every city he pacifies, he stages a grand production of his farcical tragedy written at the tender age of 12. That uh, kind of feels like Milhauser too, you know. It does. This, yeah. Um, about a man who becomes a famous general only to be murdered at the hands of a shadow of shadowy foreigners. Curiously, what he had imagined as a child turns out to be the story of his life. Almost. The playwright turned general broods obsessively about his only work, the magnificent Lupine Legion, a city in movement of 6,000 men, an invincible corps of seasoned fighters wearing their signature wolfskin caps, kills, burns, pillages, and loots their way to victory. But what does victory mean? I can't wait till this comes out. Wow. But again, it's like, oh, now we're just going to ancient Rome, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. And still it's tied to the stuff we know from his other work. Mm-hmm. You know, there's still that familiarity. Well, there's something for everybody. I, I think that's what I'm really starting to understand. And and just to not to belabor the point, but like, 
Coriolis Books says the Lime Tree was one of the first I read, and I still think about it. Mm. Also, just for fun, the literary conference. And then <laughs> David Whelan, his favorite, How I Became a Nun, a Wild Immoral Acid Trip that I feel directly influenced Samantha Schweblin. Um, James Rose Warren says Shanty Town and the Dinner are two of my favorites, but I'd love every absolutely everything mm-hmm. of his. So it's just that point of like there were some common threads, but everybody seems to have some different ones that stand out to them. You know, Gody, yeah. who says the hair and Emma, the captive W H Hudson gone surrealist and wild, you know, so just all these different people giving us so many different favorite times, passages, books. It's really for how many books that he has out. It's really fascinating to me that different ones appeal to so many different people. I think that's yeah. really interesting. It's not just the same old, same old. No. It was, it was a bunch. So, I, I do have to go pretty quick, mm-hmm. but before we go, where where are, are you going next? And are you excited by that? Or are you just, you know, someday I'll get to more? No, I am excited. I was actually debating as we've been talking. Originally, I was thinking I was going to wait a while, you know, maybe take a little break and read some other stuff. But now I'm like, well, maybe not. So the two that I own right now um, are The Hare and The Little Buddhist Monk. And so mm-hmm. from what you've told me of The Little Buddhist Monk, I know that the hair isn't necessarily your favorite. And I saw some other people say that it wasn't necessarily their favorites either. Mm-hmm. So I might be tempted to try the little Buddhist monk, but as far as ones I that love I love the own, little Buddhist monk. Okay. <laughs> Is that the well, edition that comes with the proof as well? You know, I don't know. I, I saw somebody mention that and I need to flip through it and see that the edition. Yeah, it is. Cause it has the, the greasy. Well, actually, I don't know. I'll have to look. I don't, I know it has the French fries on the front that has the little Buddhist yeah. monk, but I don't know that it does have the, the other one in there. I'll have to look and see. I think it might. If it's the New Directions one, they published the uh, the Little Buddhist Monk and the Proof in one okay. volume. Then it must and be. So. But then otherwise, just generally speaking, ones I don't own but that appeal to me, I would say the Literary Conference mm-hmm. or Art Forum, which you mentioned yeah, on the previous I love episode. That Both one. of those. <laughs> that one really appeals to me too. So those would probably be the next ones that I would I'll, go for. I'll just say as I sit here, I'm like, oh Paul, I hope I can't wait till you you read birthday which we haven't even mm-hmm. talked about. I loved birthday. I can't wait until you read the Linden tree. I can't wait until you read dinner, which we just talked about the zombie one. I can't wait until you read conversations. Another one we haven't talked about that. I love art forum, you know, the literary conference, uh, you know, you, you do have a whole bunch of really exciting ones, I think in front of you. And I, I have decided that I want to go back now and, and just, you know, space them out a little bit between other books, but I want to reread all of these oh, again, awesome. because, you know, it's going to be a while before March and the next IRA come, comes out from new directions. So no. <laughs> and one thing I'm excited about is I've noticed surprisingly that at used bookstores and like, I went to a library sale recently, which is where I picked up several of these. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of IRAs out in the wild that I've, I've come across. So I think it's going to be fun for me to kind of just treat uh-huh. it as, a, as kind of an Easter egg or treasure. Like There's some, yeah, I mean, I'm going to go out and specifically seek out certain ones and probably, you know, get them from independent bookstores and things. But I think it's going to be fun too, <laughs> just to, to kind of keep an eye out in, in used bookstores and library sales and places like that and try to pick them up too. Oh, you've got to read art for him, Paul, because one of the things <laughs> he talks about there is he's collecting this magazine, you know, these books, and he could easily go online and order them all. But it's so much more fun to go to these used book stalls, you know, to go to these fairs and find the ones you're missing. So it's just he's just speaking to you in that book. Yeah, exactly. No, that (laughs) makes me want to try that one even more. Yeah, that one sounds great. And I just thought one last fun note from from a listener. Um, The handle is my g 204 n or news my g 204 news and he says read some short stories from the magical brain to my 11 year old daughters and they loved it too he says the stories have broad appeal and are very accessible they even asked to read some of them multiple times so i just thought that was a fun way to end it of just the magic of of even these 11 year old girls Mm -hmm. who are kind of introduced to this fun world and maybe that'll be you know maybe that'll be a life lifetime uh love that they'll remember and you know yeah. Associate with their, their parents or whatever. So it's fun. And I love that idea because I can see myself reading these to my kids out loud, even the youngest ones, because there are parts that are serious. But if people are, you know, people are interested in, in this kind of thing, you know, we, we've we've talked about books that are pretty gritty and brutal, um, have a lot of content you might not want to read to your children. Right. These don't have that very often. The proof has a little bit of that. It's kind of violent. 
Um, you know, there, there are pieces, but he's, it's not like there's a bunch of foul language or the, uh, is there any sex? There probably is, but I can't really, I think it might be in the proof as well. That was when he went gritty, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's um, right. But it's not that, that common. He's mostly just these fun things. I mean, th- that can be almost like little fairy tales for your kids of these mm-hmm. bizarre stories that they'll start making connections to and having fun with the telling of it. But maybe you know, get a little deeper on the 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 thinking about it afterwards. But yeah, and anyway. to our point about different people getting different things out of them, I wouldn't be surprised if through a child's eyes, maybe they would notice or pick out things that were completely different from what we did. That'd be fun. I think I might yeah. try that. I'm going to try that. <laughs> All right, Paul. Well, I have to run. I've got a cross country meet to get to for my son. Mm. I'm excited. It's their first one of the year. Thanks nice. so much for indulging and and letting us talk about. Cesar Ira. I hope listeners yeah, no. will let us know if they jump into it and what they think. Absolutely. Yeah, give us some feedback and everybody, and I'm going to enjoy continuing to explore. Thanks for the suggestion. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Mooks and the Gripes podcast. You can follow the Mooks and the Gripes and get show notes and book and film reviews at mooksandgripes.com. On Twitter, you can follow Trevor at Mooks and Paul at BiblioPaul. You can also get information about future shows on our Patreon. If you'd like to donate to the show, anything and everything, even a dollar a month helps and is deeply appreciated. You can become a Patreon at patreon.com slash mooks. Until next time. Thank you.